Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, students, for whenever you're watching this video. This is the second video in my series on Unit 4 for AP Macro, and today we'll be talking about banking reserves and bank balance sheets. Namely, how do banks work? Why do they do what they do? And I'm going to freak you out a bit with something called fractional reserve banking. After we'll figure out how the money multiplier effect works, because there is one more multiplier we got to deal with. I'm going to go through two or three practice problems on bank balance sheets, which is sort of how we use all this information. Cool? So let's get started. Now, make sure that I have a good view on all this so you guys can see everything. This one's going to be kind of important to see what's on the screen. So, banks. The banking system in the United States is fairly complicated. There are a bunch of different banks, including commercial banks for me and you, general people, and investment banks that are geared towards investors and businesses, stuff like that. Now, bank businesses can use commercial banks. Archer, what are we doing? Get a loopy or a hairball? No, he's okay. We're all good. Dog is fine. Archer, are you on camera? On camera time. Okay, he hates he hates it so much. All right, so let's talk about it. So we have a bunch of different banks. They are regulated in, in America by what's called the Federal Reserve, which is our central bank. Basically, it's the bank's bank. The banks need a loan. They go to either each other or this bank, the Federal Reserve. It is kind of a part of our government, but also not. We'll get into that when we talk about monetary policy and how it kind of is and isn't a part of our government. But we're going to be focusing on commercial banks for today. Okay, Archie, you're free to go. Boy, does he hate... Oh, he's shedding so much. Oh, oh, it's all over my jeans. Okay, so much hair. So much hair. All right. So with commercial banks, there are sort of two things you got to be aware of. It's where you store your money. You know that. And they pay you interest for it. If it's a savings account, yes. This is labeled as a liability for the bank. Basically, the bank is liable for your deposit. If you go there, ask for your money back, they are responsible for giving you your money back. They effectively owe you that amount. However, they can also loan out money and earn interest. Those would be assets for the bank. So basically there are things the bank is responsible for, which is holding on to your money and paying you interest, but there's also bank, ways businesses, banks can act as a business and make money, which is to loan out money to other people and earn interest off of that. So interest can go both ways for a bank. They can pay you interest and they can earn interest depending on what we're talking about. Now, this is the fun part. So a question that students don't tend to ask or don't realize they don't know is where does the money for loans come from? Like when you get a loan from a bank, where did that money come from? Uh, it had to be someone's somewhere at some point. Where is that just the bank's money or what else? So the central bank, the Federal Reserve in America, has something called the reserve requirement, okay? That is the percentage of deposits that banks have to hold on to. Basically, when you deposit $100 in the bank, the bank does not take your $100 bill and hold on to it in the vault. They only actually have to hold on to a portion of it. In America, that number is typically, depending on the year, about 10%. Meaning if you put $100 in the bank, the bank actually only has to hold on to $10 of it. The rest of that money, $90 out of that 100, is where loans come from. That's the money that can be loaned out to other customers. Wait a minute, what? Yes, so for those of you who have like, let's say, none of you in my class would because you're all teenagers. Let's say you had 50 grand in the bank. Well, five grand of it, the bank is actually holding on to. The rest of it, 45,000 out of your 50,000 is loanable money for the bank. That's how banks make profit, is they take your money, hold on to a portion of it, because you're not gonna use all of it, that's the whole point, is that you're gonna keep it there for safekeeping, and they're gonna make money off of your money. Students don't tend to realize this. There's a thing a lot of people don't really get about how banks work, is that they make money by you putting your money there, because that's the money they use for loans. Which gets kind of scary of like, but wait a minute, what if everyone needs to like get their money out all at once? Uh, Great Depression style, things go really, really bad. Because of the Great Depression, people try to get all their money out all at once and realize that banks didn't have all their money, because they don't. So when everyone does that, it gets really hectic. Now, there's going to be some vocab that matters a lot for what we're about to do. But that's sort of your background information of like, okay, so banks will hold on to all of your money. All, the money that banks have goes into what's called their reserves. Reserves is the amount of total money the banks have. And it's divided into two parts, excess and required. I know it says excess first, but I'm going to go required first to explain it. 
Required reserves is the amount the bank has to hold on to. It is the percentage of the overall deposit that is required to be held on to. So it's based on the reserve requirement, which is this sort of number set by, again, in America, the Federal Reserve. Say they set it at 10%. That means that the required reserves will be 10% of the overall deposits. We'll just be chunked away and be like, cool, we have to save this chunk. This much larger chunk would be the excess reserves. The amount left over when you take out the required reserves is excess reserves. This is effectively loanable slash spendable money for the bank. This is usable money for the bank. The bank can use the excess reserves to try and make profit. They can loan it, they can invest it, they can buy bonds with it, they can do a bunch of stuff. It's all usable money for them. People don't realize that's a thing. They're like, what? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your money can be. This is why people are, some people are like kind of create, create people that are a little bit crazy, like don't want to put their money into a bank. They want to like save it in their mattress. It's like, yeah, they're a bit weird to put it like in a mattress or something. But the idea of not trusting a bank with your money, if you don't trust them, like that's a big deal because they don't hold on to all of your money. That matters a lot. So sort of a practice question around this idea. So let's say a bank has $800 million deposited in it, which isn't a crazy number. Banks are big and currently has $100 million in reserves, in total overall reserves, they've got $100 million. To be clear, the reason why this would happen is that $700 million was already sort of like loaned out. If the reserve requirement is 10%, how much money does the bank have in excess reserves? So again, it should be mentioned that reserves gets chunked down to two parts. Excess, that's a good EX, and required. They've got a hundred million in reserves, so let's use blue for that. We've got to figure out how much have gone, how did the split work is basically what the question is asking. How did the split go and how much of it ended in required reserves or how much of it ended in excess reserves? So here's the key thing, 10% of the reserve requirement. You have to understand, to get this question right, that the reserve requirement is not the percentage of the reserves the bank has to hold on to, it's the percentage of your deposits the banks have to hold on to. So if there is 800 million deposited there, then banks have to hold on to 10% of that number, of the 800. 10% of 800 is 80. So they, they, they have to have $80 million, that's a dollar sign, not a cent sign, I just didn't finish the S right. $80 million has to be in the required reserves because they have to have 10% of the deposit, 10% of 800, it's 80. If they have 100 in total reserves and 80 of it's required, the excess, the leftover, that's how I refer to excess reserves, like leftovers, would be 20 million. So the answer here is B. 20 million. Again, the way I figured that out was I know there's 100 million in total reserves. We have 100 million combined between excess and required. I've got to figure out the required because I can, because they gave me the reserve requirement. Reserve requirement is 10%. Now it's not 10% of 100 million, it's 10% of 800 million they have to hold on to. 10% of 800 is 80. That's the required. The question asked me about excess reserves. So if I have 100 in total reserves, 80 of it's required, that means 20 of it is excess. Tricky, tricky question. This is an AP exam multiple choice question, by the way. Pulled it from an AP exam. Okay. Now, all of that is background information for sort of how banks keep track of all of this. Because there's a bunch of assets that banks have and a bunch of things that banks are liable for, namely your deposits. But if a bank gets out of, gets a loan from another bank, they're liable for that too. And that happens, by the way. Okay, So a, we have something called a bank balance sheet, also referred to as a T account. Okay, This is a chart, a T chart, like literally a T chart, like a pro and con list. It's like a classic example of a T chart where you've got assets and liabilities. I'll show you a bunch of examples, don't worry. In your assets column, you'll have things like the reserves and loans, basically things the bank can use to make money. Okay things the bank can make money off of. The reserves is like the bank's way of phrasing your deposit like this is money that we have that we can use, okay? The liabilities are things that they're responsible for. So your deposit, they if you came to them and asked for your money, they would have to give you your money. So your deposit, they're liable for. 
if they have a loan from the Federal Reserve, which they can borrow from, or other banks, that's a liability for them too. And if they have owner's equity, which is money that the owner of the bank personally invested into it, they're also kind of liable for that too. The most important thing to know about a T account or a bank balance sheet is that both sides have to equal one another. This is a classic um, finance thing where assets equal liabilities. Assets equal liabilities. So whatever you see on the left column has to equal whatever you see on the right column, which will frame questions on the AP exam on how they ask for this. Because the bank balance sheet is a, actually an FRQ that you could see on your AP exam. Let me move myself over into this corner. So an example of it, a very simplified example of it, is we have this bank balance sheet. We've got assets, we've got liabilities. It's important to mention that these two sides are made up of the same money. So whoever put this $1,000 deposit in this liability side, this asset side is what the bank chose to do with that $1,000, which is why both sides have to equal one another because it's the same money on both sides. It's just sort of different ways of categorizing it. Where on the right side, it's what they're responsible for, and the left side is what they use that to make money for. So if we look at it, there's this $1,000 deposit. The bank has 250 in required reserves, 500 currently in excess, and 250 that they have loaned out to other people. It's an asset because they're going to get paid back that plus interest over time. So you can see some questions like this, where it's what is the required reserve ratio here? Well, if there's 250 in required reserves and a thousand dollar deposit, then the required reserve ratio would have to be 25%. Now, again, on the AP economics exam, there is no calculator, so they cannot be crazy in how they do this. They have to keep this kind of simple from a math standpoint. So 250 and 1,000, yeah, that can work. 500 and 2,000, yeah, that can work. Okay. Which means that initially they actually had 750 in excess reserves. This bank just chose to loan out 250 of that 750. If that makes sense. Okay. Now, another thing they could ask is what happens to this bank balance sheet if a customer withdraws $500 from their account? So, this is sort of like the process of working through a balance sheet. So, a customer is going to withdraw $500 from this bank. There's no longer $1,000 deposited there, right? They took out $500. So there's now just $500 deposited there. Okay, with me so far. Has to come from this side too, because it's the same money, to be clear. So where did that money come from? Well, probably not the required reserves, because they have to hold on to that. It would probably come from the excess. They can't call back this. This money's been loaned out. So like they can't be like, hey guys, you want to give me your loan money back? That's super awkward, not going to happen. So it would drop excess reserves down to zero temporarily. And I say temporarily for one big reason. There are two rules when it comes to a bank balance sheet. I mentioned the first one already, which is that both sides have to equal one another. So check, check, that works. 250 plus 250 equals 500. That rule we're following. So the first rule called a bank balance sheet has to balance. Balance. A equals L. Assets equals liabilities. The second rule, reserve requirement holds. The reserve requirement holds. What that means is that the reserve requirement or the required reserve ratio, these are the same, same thing, same thing, by the way. This and this are the same thing has to maintain being true. It doesn't change. It's set by the Federal Reserve. So in this case, the reserve ratio is 25%, which means whatever number is here needs to be 25% of whatever number is here. And the number on this side dropped to 500. That would mean that this is no longer 250. This is 125 because they should only be holding 25% of their deposits in their required reserves. But where did the other 125 here go? Where did the 125 here go? Where did that money go? It went to the excess reserves. It's now left over. They can now use that money. So here is how this problem would actually end up. They could ask things like, okay, 
what will happen to the excess reserves if a customer withdraws $500? And what you would say is the excess reserves wouldn't drop to zero because that only happens for like a millisecond. They would drop to 125, which is weird. It's weird. It's complicated. This is hard. But you've got to remember these two rules. Both sides have to balance and both. These both need to happen. And the reserve requirement has to stay true. It needs to be 25% of whatever is here. Okay, 25% of 500 isn't 250. 25% of 500 is 125. So my required reserves are now 125, which means that 250 of required reserves, I sort of just broke apart into 125 of it's gonna stay here. The other 125 is freed up. It's now excess reserves. So it goes to the excess reserves. This still totals up to 500. Both rules are now true. Problem solved. So the way that you know that you're working through a balance sheet problem right is that at the end, these two rules stayed accurate. That this, you're still following these two rules. That at the end of the day, assets and liabilities equal each other, check. And at the end of the day, the required reserves part here match the reserve requirement. 25% of 500 is 125, check. 250 is not 25% of 500. So that was wrong. That's why I had to go an extra step to solve that. Complicated. I know that's hard. Welcome to the hard unit. Okay. Now, on top of that, a weird thing is this loan process. So we talked about loaning money out. So let's sort of go through the logic of it. Let's say the reserve ratio is 10% because it is. And let's say that you, person watching this video, deposits $1,000 in the bank. I'm glad you have $1,000. Good for you. We are all very proud of you. You have $1,000 in the bank. Okay. Based on what I've been saying so far, how much of that does the bank have to hold on to? Well, 10%. So they have to hold on to $100 of it, right? That goes to their required reserves. But the rest of it, 900 is now loanable. Well, let's say Bob conveniently needs a loan for $900. Say he's buying a laptop or something for college. Because banks can loan out the small amount of money. They tend not to, but they can loan out the small amount of money. So they lend $900 out to Bob. Here's the weird thing. This is so messed up. Logically, this will break your brain for a second. How do I, okay. When you take out a loan from a bank, where does that money go initially? Before you spend it, before Bob goes to Best Buy and buys his laptop, where is that $900 going to go? Is he going to carry it around in the form of cash? Probably not. That's kind of a lot of money to have in cash. Bob is probably going to put, keep that in his bank account, right? That's where this gets really dicey. Because I can speak from personal experience here. My mom was selling our her house that I grew up in like a few years ago. And I had to help her get a loan for it because she was like moving out of the country and I needed to have things in my bank account so that I could transfer it to hers. It was a whole thing. What ended up happening was she got a loan for like seven grand to help do like the last bit of like refurnishing and fixing up the house before she put it on the market. And that money got put into my account. She got a $7,000 loan and that money got transferred into my bank account. Banks can have to hold on to 10% of money deposited into your account, but they can loan out the other 90%. So here's what's going to happen to this money for Bob. If Bob puts it in the bank, which is very likely, very likely that he does that because he's at the bank already. He's just like, cool, give me the loan for 900 days. Keep it in my account. I'll just go to Best Buy later this week or whatever. The, his bank only has to hold on to $90 of it. The bank can loan out $810 of it. Wait a minute, what? The bank is loaning out a loan using money from a previous loan? Yes, person who's concerned watching this video. They are! It can loan out $810 to Jill. And if Jill deposits her money in the bank, 90% can be loaned out, 10% they gotta hold on to, again, 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 again. So far, just off of two steps, the initial deposit of $1,000 has caused the actual creation of $1,710 of actual spendable money. You put $1,000 into the bank, the bank has turned that $1,000 into $1,710 two steps in. Uh, that should be kind of scary to you and the idea of like, wait, banks are making money. Yes, they are. Couldn't that cause inflation? Yes, it does. You're right to assume that that is a thing that happens. 
And two, you're like, wait a minute. So Jill has my money and Bob has my money? Yes. And they have more of your money than you even do. Wild to think. As long as people pay it back, you're super fine. And the fun part is the bank gets to make like quintuple slash septuple slash infinituple profit off of this because they can loan out loans of 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 loans like indent, 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 indent of loans of loans of loans and make a crap ton. But this kind of thing should one scare you and sound kind of familiar to something from last unit. This idea of like money getting split and then split and then split and then split and one initial change having a much larger impact than you think sounds a hell of a lot like the multiplier effect, right? With GDP, where we spent a thousand dollars, but that money goes somewhere and gets spent again and spent again and spent again. You deposit your money, someone takes out a loan, that money gets loaned again and again and again and again. It's another multiplier effect. It's called the money multiplier. I don't know why that's, there you go. It's called the money multiplier. This is the only last, this is the last multiplier, I promise. There's only three. There's spending, tax, and money. That's it. So the money multiplier tells us how much the money supply can be changed by, by banks doing this fractional reserve banking thing, this split and add and split and add and split and add. It's important to mention this takes some time. This is not an initial change in the money supply. This is an eventual change in the money supply, which will come up in questions. They'll ask things like, how much does this change the money supply by initially versus eventually? If you see the word eventual or over time, that means it's a money multiplier problem. In fact, if you see the words over time, that is probably a multiplier problem kind of period because it takes time to do those. And your money multiplier will look a lot like the spending multiplier did. Remember, the spending multiplier was one over MPS. It was the reciprocal of the savings. Same exact idea here. It's the reciprocal of the reserve requirement or the required reserve ratio, which is that like 10% the Federal Reserve makes, you, makes the bank hold on to. 10% would be 0.1, so it would be 1 over 0.1 would get you the money multiplier. 1 over 0.1 is 10. So what you do to find the overall change in the money supply, that is sort of like the thing you are looking for when there's a money multiplier problem, is how much are banks going to change the money supply by, is you take the change in the excess reserve, because that's the loanable money, multiply that by the money multiplier, gets you the change in the money supply. So if I use the question we just did, which is that you deposit $1,000 into the bank, Cool. How much are excess reserves changing by if you deposit $1,000 into the bank? Well, the bank has to hold on to 10%. That's what I mentioned in that question. So excess reserves go up by 900 times. I need to do one over my reserve requirement, which again was 10% in that previous problem. So one over 0.1 equals the change in the supply of money. I'm going to write that SM. 900 times 10 is $9,000, meaning when you deposit $900 into the bank, the bank could, in theory, maximum, it's the max, it's just not going to necessarily happen to this, this level, but it can happen to this level. The money supply could increase by as much as $9,000. So one, when we talk about like printing money, we don't have to print that much money. Not really. We do still every now and then print money just to make sure that we have it in circulation or we print new bills or we update bills and stuff like that. So we do print money, yes. But there are a lot of other ways for the money supply to change than just us printing money. Basically, if at the end of the day, banks end up with more money, the money supply will grow. If at the end of the day, banks end up with less money, the money supply will shrink because the multiplier effect would work in reverse as well. So money supply can be changed by this too. Oh, Nelly. So again, when I say money supply here, I mean M1 and the money supply. So here's a more complicated version of the balance sheet with that question kind of asked. So we've got required reserves, 2,000, excess reserves, 3,000. This bank has bought $5,000 worth of treasury bonds. It's just bonds from the U.S. Treasury. It's a part of the U.S. government. And has loaned out 15 grand. There was $20,000 deposited there initially, and the owner of the bank chipped in five grand to sort of help the bank. The bank is kind of liable for that money. They should probably pay that owner back eventually, so it's a liability technically. But first things first, both sides are 25K. 
25,000, 5,000, 10,000, 25,000 when I add it all up. So we're starting off correctly here. Bob's going to deposit $1,000. Good for him. What is the required reserve ratio? All right, 20,000 and 2,000. All right, so that's 10%. I know that I know the 10% come up a lot because it is the actual reserve requirement. It doesn't have to be 10%. It could be 20, it could be 25, it could be 50%. But in this case, it's 10 because 2,000 to 20,000 is 10%. If Bob deposits $1,000, will M1 initially increase, decrease, or not change? This is initially. This is not eventual. This is not asking about the multiplier effect. This is just asking what happens to M1. The first thing you got to know, which is notes from last, the last video, is that the M1 is the amount of money held in currency in circulation, so like cash, as well as money held in like demand deposits, so money that's like stored in the bank. So if Bob deposits $1,000, that means $1,000 is moving from cash to the bank. The, this question is a trick question. Reason being, if money supply, if M1 is made up of both money held in banks and money held in the form of cash, and I move it from one category to the other, minus 1,000 here, plus 1,000 here, my money supply is the same. Like total number wise, the money supply doesn't increase or decrease. It changes its composition a little bit. There's a thousand less in cash and a thousand more in banks, but those were the two things that made up M1. It was demand deposits and cash in circulation. Okay, well, they move from one to the other. That's not actually changing the money supply. Not initially. It will eventually because of the multiplier effect, but it says initially, so I can't go down the multiplier road just yet. Okay. Bob deposits $1,000. How much are going are the required reserves and excess reserves now? Okay. Well, the required reserves, if he deposits 1,000 and the reserve ratio is 10%, then out of that 1,000, I know that 10% of it gets added to the required reserves. So this would no longer be 2,000. It would be 2,100, which is 21,000. Required reserves would now be 2,100. The bank has to hold on to 10% of his $1,000 deposit. So the bank has to hold on to 100. So we just add 100 to the required reserves. How much are the excess reserves? Well, out of that 1,000, they had to hold on to 10%. So they have 900 left over. It's a nine out of four. Okay. How much more money can the bank lend out? After his deposit, well, how much of that deposit can the bank lend out? All of the excess reserves. So they can lend out 900 more now. They can lend out in total 3,900. That's the total amount they can lend out. But in terms of more, it would be 900 because that was the change in the excess reserves. That's the usable money. And then what is the maximum change in the money supply from that deposit? Actually, the same exact answer as the previous one. I take the change in excess reserves, 900, times the multiplier, 1 over 0 0.1. 1 over 0 0.1 is 10. This means the money supply could go up by $9,000 here. $9,000 is the amount that it could go up by. So that's a T account problem. That is a bank balance sheet problem where they ask you things like, okay, reserve requirement you can get asked about, excess and required reserves you can get asked about very easily. In fact, they should be asking about that. If they ask how much more the bank can be lent out, remember that excess reserves is how much you can effectively use. This amount here is 15K has already been loaned out. It's gone. It is someone else has that money right now. It's just an asset for the bank because the bank's going to make money off of it. But the bank doesn't have 15k in loans. They have loaned out 15k. So how much more can they loan out? The 900 that was added. And what's the maximum change in the money supply from that deposit? You take the deposit. So you take the change in the excess reserves. Excess reserves went up by 900. Multiply by the multiplier. One over 0.1, which is one over 0.1 in this case. So 10. Multiply it. 900 dollars. Let's do one more. So here is an FRQ from I think the 2014 AP exam. Pause the video 
work through it. Let's check and see how you're doing. Pause this video, work through this FRQ. You actually can't answer C it yet. If you've watched future videos, you will be able to answer C, but C is technically about a thing that we have not covered yet. That's a monetary policy thing. But answer parts A and B. You can answer those two. Pause the video, go. All right, unpause the video, I'm ready to answer it. So, what is the reserve requirement here? It's the first question they ask because it's the easiest question to answer. $100,000 in deposits, $10,000 in reserves, easy 10%. Again, it has to be a doable percentage, so it's not a lot of options for that. Like you have to be able to do one over this thing in decimal form. So like one over 0.1, that's doable. Assume that Luis withdraws five grand in cash from his checking account at ETR Bank. Okay. So he's taking 5k out. I'm not going to do it yet, but I'm going to be aware of that. By how much will ETR Bank's reserves change based on Luis's withdrawal? How much will the reserves change by? Okay. This seems kind of tricky. The reason why is it doesn't say excess or required. It just says reserves, and that means the total reserves. Well, that's actually easy. <laughs> he's withdrawing five grand from his checking account. Okay, the reserves are going to change by five grand. Like between these two, they will change by a total of five grand. This is going to drop by five grand, and this side's going to drop by five grand. Uh, they super can't change this loan number because again, they've already loaned out that money. So it'll have to be between these two five grands coming out. So the reserves will change by five grand. What is the initial effect, not eventual, initial effect on the M1? Mentioned this in the last thing. No change. There is no change in the money supply initially because money has moved from cash to a demand deposit and both of those things count in M1. So if you're explaining it, that's what I would say. You'd say it does not change M1 because both cash and money held in demand deposits count towards M1. So moving them from one category to the other. I'll turn off real quick, sorry. Phone call from the school actually. So moving between cash and demand deposits, minus 5,000 from one, plus 5,000 to the other, nets out to no change. And then three, as a result of the withdrawal, what is the new value of excess reserves on the bank balance sheet based on that reserve requirement? Okay, so we gotta do some stuff here. This 100 grand drops down to 95 grand. This 5,000 drops down initially like microsecond drops to zero. And then I go back to my first two rules. Remember my two rules were that both sides have to add up to the same total. So 95,000, 95,000, we're good there. This owner's equity, by the way, is just there to tell you that there wasn't any owner's equity, so you don't have to worry about it. The second rule is that my reserve requirement has to stay true. It is still 10% and 10K is not 10% of 95,000. 10% of 95,000 is 9,500. But where did that 500 go? Because this dropped from 10K to 9,500. That means I took out of that 10K, 95,000 is staying there. Or 9,500 is staying there. 500 of it's going where? Well, now it's left over. So now it goes to the excess reserves. And that is the answer to C. $500. And again, that totals up. So let's check my two rules again. My two rules were that both totaled to the same thing. 95,000 and this is 10,000. So 95,000 on this side too. And the reserve requirement stays true. 10%, 9,500, 95,000. Check. Both rules have been followed. Solve the bank balance sheet. I'll answer C here, even though you have no idea what the reference for this is. Assume the next day John withdraws from ETR Bank an amount that exceeds the bank's excess reserves. Say John were to withdraw 10K from this bank. Assuming no loans are called in, meaning they can't like bring this money back, how could an ETR Bank cover its required reserves? The idea here is that if he withdraws too much, then the bank won't actually have enough money to be able to cover their required reserves. This is the fear you guys have if you're paying attention, which is that 
if I withdraw too much money, can the bank even have enough money to give to people? They can, because there's a thing that you're forgetting that banks can do, which is banks, just like you, if they're running low on money, can borrow it. So an answer to C would be that banks can borrow money from either other banks, they do that, or from the Federal Reserve. Okay, banks can borrow from another bank or from the Federal Reserve as a means of covering their required reserves for the day. If a bank comes up short of money, they can always borrow it from somebody else. That's the idea. Okay, I know I have like three more of these FRQs on the slideshow. I know what I got. Okay, just got just one more. You, I would recommend if you want an additional bit of practice, you can work through this problem and then search it. Because this is a released FRQ, this, these answers are public online. I would work through this FRQ, this last one, because this covers some stuff from yesterday also, from the previous video. You can work through this one and then Google it and see it. We will be doing practice over this type of thing tomorrow. And by tomorrow, I mean Friday in my class, which this is like Friday, November 6th, I wanna say, because time's weird right now. Okay, we'll be doing practice over money multiplier, bank balance sheet, Fisher effect, that stuff we'll be covering in a practice on Friday. But if you want one extra go of this before that practice, or through this FRQ, Google it, you'll find the answers. Trust me, they're all out there. Just Google Sewell Bank AP Macro FRQ, you'll find it. It's public. And then we're in double check your responses on that. Okay. Whew. That's a hard one. There's some hard stuff in that bit in that PowerPoint, guys. So the big things are fractional reserve banking, which is that the banks hold onto a portion of your deposit but loan out the rest of it. That allows them to do something called the money multiplier effect, meaning by loaning out that money, it getting deposited again and then loaned out again, they're effectively creating money. More money is now existing in the economy than actually physically exists in the bank's vault. Banks' money that they have gets chunked down into sort of two categories of excess reserves and required reserves. Required, they have to do first. It gets taken out of the initial deposit. It's how much the bank has to hold on to. Excess is everything left over and is money the bank can use for whatever. They can buy stuff with it. They can use it for loans. They can buy furniture. They can do whatever they wanted with it. The bank balance sheet has assets and liabilities and then both sides have to one match and the reserve requirement has to stay true. So if the reserve requirement is 10%, then the required reserves have to be 10% of the deposit. Okay, you'll see things like the reserves on the asset side along with loans and bonds, liabilities would be the deposits, as well as loans that the bank might have from other banks, things that they're liable for, and be able to solve through a bank balance sheet problem. These are tricky, these are hard, these require quite a bit of practice, so don't be afraid to do more than you need to. Always feel free to look stuff up and search for bank balance sheet problems, AP macro. Bust your butt through a few of them. They're useful, they're helpful, they're good problems. They are, they, trust me, they are. They are hard, but they're cool because they're kind of like Sudoku, where you like solve it, you balance it, you're like, oh, oh, oh. There's like a, that like satisfaction of doing like a Sudoku puzzle when I finish the bank balance sheet problem to this point. Be aware of the money multiplier and how that formula works, which is again, one over the reserve requirement is the money multiplier. And then you take the change in excess reserves times that multiplier gives you the change in the money supply. And again, that is the eventual change in the money supply. That is not an initial thing. That is an eventual thing. And that should be it. Mm, yeah, that's it. That's the whole thing. It's a lot, I know. And it's kind of hard, I know, trust me. We're in the, we're in the hard part of the class now. I think unit four and unit three, to a lesser extent, are the two hardest parts of the class. This, there's just a bunch of stuff you've never heard of before that is going to throw you for a loop. You just got to get used to it. You got to practice it. Practice it a whole bunch. Okay. But that is it. If you've got questions, feel free to email me or post them in the comments. I'll do my best to respond to them. Thank you guys very much for watching. I wish you absolute the best. The absolute best. There we go. See you, everybody.